Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring The End of the World Time Enough at Last by Marilyn Venable Time Fuse by Randall Garrett Dr. Komatevsky's Day by Fritz Leiber The Sons of Japheth by Richard Wilson Homecoming by Miguel Hidalgo Time Enough at Last by Marilyn Venable Writing as Lynn Venable Originally published in If Worlds of Science Fiction, January 1953 Narrated by Tom Trusser The atomic bomb meant, to most people, the end to Henry Bemis it meant something far different, a thing to appreciate and enjoy. For a long time Henry Bemis had had an ambition to read a book, not just the title or the preface or a page somewhere in the middle. He wanted to read the whole thing all the way through from beginning to end. A simple ambition perhaps, but in the cluttered life of Henry Bemis an impossibility. Henry had no time of his own. There was his wife, Agnes, who owned that part of it that his employer, Mr. Carsville, did not buy. Henry was allowed enough to get to and from work, that in itself being quite a concession on Agnes's part. Also, nature had conspired against Henry by handing him with a pair of hopelessly myopic eyes. Poor Henry literally couldn't see his hand in front of his face. For a while, when he was very young, his parents had thought him an idiot. When they realised it was his eyes, they got glasses for him. He was never quite able to catch up. There was never enough time. It looked as though Henry's ambition would never be realised. Then something happened which changed all that. Henry was down in the vault of the East Side Bank and Trust when it happened. He had stolen a few moments from the duties of his teller's cage to try and read a few pages of the magazine he had bought that morning. He had made an excuse to Mr. Carsville about needing bills in large denominations for a certain customer, and then, safe inside the dim recesses of the vault, he had pulled from inside his coat the pocket-sized magazine. He had just started a picture article cheerfully entitled, The New Weapons and What They'll Do to You! when all the noise in the world crashed in upon his eardrums. It seemed to be inside of him and outside of him all at once. Then the concrete floor was rising up at him and the ceiling came slanting down towards him, and for a fleeting second Henry thought of a story he had started to read once called The Pit and the Pendulum. He regretted in that insane moment that he had never had time to finish that story to see how it came out then all was darkness and quiet and unconsciousness. When Henry came to, he knew that something was desperately wrong with the Eastside Bank and Trust. The heavy steel door of the vault was buckled and twisted and the floor tilted up at a dizzy angle, while the ceiling dipped crazily toward it. Henry gingerly got to his feet, moving arms and legs experimentally. Assured that nothing was broken, he tenderly raised a hand to his eyes. His precious glasses were intact, thank God. He would never have been able to find his way out of the shattered vault without them. He made a mental note to write Dr. Torrance to have a spare pair made and mailed to him. Blasted nuisance not having his prescription on file locally, but Henry trusted no one but Dr. Torrance to grind those thick lenses into his own complicated prescription. Henry removed the heavy glasses from his face, Instantly the room dissolved into a neutral blur. Henry saw a pink splash that he knew was his hand, and a white blob came up to meet the pink as he withdrew his pocket handkerchief and carefully dusted the lenses. As he replaced the glasses, they slipped down on the bridge of his nose a little. He had been meaning to have them tightened for some time. He suddenly realised, without the realisation actually entering his conscious thoughts, that something momentous had happened something worse than a boiler blowing up, something worse than a gas main exploding, something worse than anything that had ever happened before. He felt that way because it was so quiet. 
was no whine of sirens, no shouting, no running, just an ominous and all-pervading silence. Henry walked across the slanting floor. Slipping and stumbling on the uneven surface, he made his way to the elevator. The car laid crumpled at the foot of the shaft like a discarded accordion. There was something inside of it that Henry could not look at, something that had once been a person, or perhaps several people. It was impossible to tell now. Feeling sick, Henry staggered toward the stairway. The steps were still there, but so jumbled and piled back upon one another that it was more like climbing the side of a mountain than mounting a stairway. It was quiet in the huge chamber that had been the lobby of the bank. It looked strangely cheerful, with the sunlight shining through the girders where the ceiling had fallen. The dappled sunlight glinted across the silent lobby, and everywhere there were huddled lumps of unpleasantness that made Henry sick as he tried not to look at them. Mr. Carsville, he called, was very quiet. Something had to be done, of course. This was terrible. Right in the middle of a Monday, too. Mr. Carswell would know what to do. He called again, more loudly, and his voice cracked hoarsely. Mr. Carswell! And then he saw an arm and a shoulder extending out from under a huge fallen block of marble ceiling. In the buttonhole was the white carnation Mr. Carswell had worn to work that morning. And on the third finger of that hand was a massive signet ring, also belonging to Mr. Carswell. Numbly... Henry realised that the wrist of Mr. Carswell was under that block of marble. Henry felt a pang of real sorrow. Mr. Carswell was gone, and so was the rest of the staff, Mr. Wilkinson and Mr. Emery and Mr. Prithard, and the same with Pete and Ralph and Jenkins and Hunter and Pat the guard and Willie the doorman. There was no one to say what was to be done about the Eastside Bank and Trust except Henry Bemis, and Henry wasn't worried about the bank and was something he wanted to do. He climbed carefully over piles of fallen masonry. Once he stepped down into something that crunched and squashed beneath his feet, and he set his teeth on edge to keep from retching. The street was not much different from the inside. Bright sunlight and so much concrete to crawl over, but the unpleasantness was much, much worse. Everywhere there were strange, motionless lumps that Henry could not look at. Suddenly, he remembered Agnes. He should be trying to get to Agnes, shouldn't he? He remembered a poster he had seen that said, In event of emergency, do not use the telephone. Your loved ones are as safe as you. He wondered about Agnes. He looked at the smashed automobiles, some with their four wheels pointing skyward like the stiffened legs of dead animals. He couldn't get to Agnes now anyway. If she was safe, then she was safe. Otherwise, of course, Henry knew Agnes wasn't safe. He had a feeling that there wasn't anyone safe for a long, long way, maybe not in the whole state or the whole country or the whole world. No, that was a thought Henry didn't want to think. He forced it from his mind and turned his thoughts back to Agnes. She had been a pretty good wife now that it was all said and done. It wasn't exactly her fault if people didn't have time to read nowadays. It was just that there was the house, and the bank, and the yard. There were the Joneses for Bridge, and the Graysons for Canasta and Charades with the Bryants. And the television, the television Agnes loved to watch but would never watch alone. She'd never had time to read even a newspaper. He started thinking about last night, that business about the newspaper. Henry had settled into his chair, quietly, afraid that a creaking spring might call to Agnes' attention the fact that he was momentarily unoccupied. He had unfolded the newspaper slowly and carefully. The sharp crackle of the paper would have been a clarion call to Agnes. He had glanced at the headlines of the first page. Collapse of conference imminent. He didn't have time to read the article. He turned to the second page. Solon predicts war only days away. He flipped through the pages faster, reading brief snatches here and there, afraid to spend too much time on any one item. On a back page was a brief article entitled Prehistoric Artifacts Unearthed in Yucatan. Henry smiled to himself and carefully folded the sheet of paper into fourth. 
That would be interesting. He would read all of it. Then it came. Agnes's voice. Henry! And then she was upon him. She lightly flicked the paper out of his hands and into the fireplace. He saw the flames lick up and curl possessively around the unread article. Agnes continued. Henry, tonight is the Joneses' bridge night. They'll be here in thirty minutes, and I'm not dressed yet, and here you are, reading. She had emphasised the last word as though it was an unclean act. Hurry and shave, you know how smooth Jasper Jones's chin always looks, and then straighten up this room. She glanced regretfully toward the fireplace. Oh dear, that paper, the television schedule. Oh well, after the Jones leaves, there won't be time for anything but the late, late movie, and don't just sit there, Henry, hurry! Henry was hurrying now, but hurrying too much. He cut his leg on a twisted piece of metal that had once been an automobile fender. He thought about things like lockjaw and gangrene, and his hand trembled as he tied his pocket handkerchief around the wound. In his mind he saw the fire again, licking across the face of last night's newspaper. He thought that now he would have time to read all the newspapers he wanted to, only now there wouldn't be any more. The heap of rubble across the street had been the Gazette building. It was terrible to think there would never be another up-to-date newspaper. Agnes would have been very upset, no television schedule. But then, of course, no television. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't. That wouldn't have been fitting, not at all. He could see the building he was looking for now, but the silhouette was strangely changed. The great circular dome was now a ragged semicircle, half of it gone, and one of the great wings of the building had fallen in upon itself. A sudden panic gripped Henry Bemis. What if they were all ruined, destroyed, every one of them? What if there wasn't a single one left? Tears of helplessness welled in his eyes as he painfully fought his way over and through the twisted fragments of the city. He thought of the building when it had been whole. He remembered the many nights he had paused outside its wide and welcoming doors. He thought of the warm nights when the doors had been thrown open and he could see the people inside, see them sitting at the plain wooden tables with the stacks of books beside them. He used to think then, what a wonderful thing a public library was, a place where anybody, anybody at all, could go in and read. He had been tempted to enter many times. He had watched the people through the open doors, the man in greasy work clothes who sat near the door, night after night, laboriously studying, a technical journal perhaps, difficult for him, but promising a brightest future. There had been an aged, scholarly gentleman who had sat on the other side of the door, leisurely paging, moving his lips a little as he did so, a man having little time left, but rich in time, because he could do with it as he chose. Henry had never gone in. He had started up the steps once, got almost to the door, but then he remembered Agnes, her questions and shouting, and he had turned away. He was going in now, though, almost crawling, his breath coming in stabbing gasps, his hands torn and bleeding. His trouser leg was sticky red where the wound in his leg had soaked through the handkerchief. It was throbbing badly, but Henry didn't care. He had reached his destination. Part of the inscription was still there, over the now doorless entrance. P-U-B-C-L-I-B-R. The rest had been torn away. The place was in shambles. The shelves were overturned, broken, smashed, tilted, their precious contents spilled in disorder upon the floor. A lot of the books, Henry noted gleefully, were still intact, still whole, still readable. He was literally knee-deep in them. He wallowed in books. He picked one up. The title was Collected Works of William Shakespeare. Yes, he must read that sometime. He laid it aside carefully. He picked up another, Spinoza. He tossed it away, seized another, and another, and still another. Which to read first? There were so many. He had been conducting himself a little like a starving man in a delicatessen, grabbing a little of this and a little of that in a frenzy of enjoyment. But now he steadied away. 
From the pile about him he selected one volume, sat comfortably down on an overturned shelf, and opened the book. Henry Bemis smiled. There was a rumble of complaining stone, minute in comparison, which the epic complaints following the fall of the bomb. This one occurred under one corner of the shelf upon which Henry sat. The shelf moved, threw him off balance. The glasses slipped from his nose and fell with a tinkle. He bent down, clawing blindly, and found, finally, their smashed remains. A minor, indirect destruction stemming from the sudden wholesale smashing of a city. But the only one that greatly interested Henry Bemis. He stared down at the blurred page before him. He began to cry. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Time Fuse by Randall Garrett Originally published in If Worlds of Science Fiction, March 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell Commander Benedict kept his eyes on the rear plate as he activated the intercom. All right, cut the power. We ought to be safe enough here. As he released the intercom, Dr. Leica of the astronomical staff stepped up to his side. Perfectly safe, he nodded, although even at this distance a star-going nova ought to be quite a display. Benedict didn't shift his gaze from the plate. Do you have your instruments set up? Not quite, but we have plenty of time. The light won't reach us for several hours yet. Remember, we were outracing it at ten lights. The commander finally turned, slowly letting his breath out in a soft sigh. Dr. Leica, I would say that this is just about the foulest coincidence that could happen to the first interstellar vessel ever to leave the solar system. Leica shrugged. In one way of thinking, yes. It is certainly true that we will never know, now, whether Alpha Centauri A ever had any planets. But in another way, it is extremely fortunate that we should be so near a stellar explosion because of the wealth of scientific information we can obtain. As you say, it is a coincidence, and probably one that happens only once in a billion years. The chances of any particular star going nova are small. That we should be so close when it happens is of a vanishing small order of probability. Commander Benedict took off his cap and looked at the damp stain in the sweat pad. Nevertheless, Doctor, it is damned unnerving to come out of ultra-drive a couple of hundred million miles from the first star ever visited by man and have to turn tail and run because the damn thing practically blows up in your face. Like I could see that Benedict was upset. He rarely used the same profanity twice in one sentence. They had been downright lucky at that. If Leica hadn't seen the star begin to swell and brighten, if he hadn't known what it meant, or if Commander Benedict hadn't been quick enough in shifting the ship back into ultra-drive, Leica had a vision of an incandescent cloud of gaseous metal that had once been a spaceship. The intercom buzzed. The commander answered, Yes? Sir, would you tell Dr. Leica that we have everything set up now? Leica nodded and turned to leave. I guess we have nothing to do now but wait. When the light from the Nova did come, Commander Benedict was back at the plate again, the forward one this time, since the ship had been turned around in order to align the astronomy lab in the nose with the star. Alpha Centauri A began to brighten and spread. It made Benedict think of a light bulb connected through a rheostat, with someone turning that rheostat, turning it until the circuit was well overloaded. The light began to hurt Benedict's eyes even at that distance, and he had to cut down the receptivity in order to watch. After a while, he turned away from the plate. Not because the show was over, but simply because it had slowed to a point beyond which no change seemed to have taken place to the human eye. Five weeks later, much to Leica's chagrin, Commander Benedict announced that they had to leave the vicinity. 
The ship had only been provisioned to go to Alpha Centauri, scout the system without landing on any of the planets, and return. At ten lights, top speed for the ultra drive, it would take better than three months to get back. I know you'd like to watch it go through the complete cycle, Benedict said, but we can't go back home as a bunch of starved skeletons. Laika resigned himself to the necessity of leaving much of his work unfinished, and although he knew it was a case of sour grapes, consoled himself with the thought that he could at least get most of the remaining information from the 500-inch telescope on Luna four years from then. As the ship slipped into the not-quite space through which the ultra-drive propelled it, Laika began to consolidate the material he had already gathered. Commander Benedict wrote in the log, Fifty-four days out from Sol, Alpha Centauri has long since faded back into its pre-blow-up state, since we have far outdistanced the light from its explosion. It now looks as it did two years ago. It... Pardon me, Commander, Laika interrupted, but I have something interesting to show you. Benedict took his fingers off the keys and turned around in his chair. What is it, Doctor? Laika frowned at the papers in his hand. I've been doing some work on the probability of that explosion happening just as it did, and I've come up with some rather frightening figures. As I said before, the probability was small. A little calculation has given us some information which makes it even smaller. For instance, with a possible error of plus or minus two seconds, Alpha Centauri A began to explode the instant we came out of ultra-drive. Now, the probability of that occurring comes out so small that it should happen only once in 10 to the 467th seconds. It was Commander Benedict's turn to frown. So? Commander, the entire universe is only about 10 to the 17th seconds old. But to give you an idea, let's say that the chances of its happening are once in millions of trillions of years. Benedict blinked. The number he realised, was totally beyond his comprehension, or anyone else's. Well, so what? Now it has happened that one time. That simply means that it will be almost certainly never happen again. True. But, Commander, when you buck odds like that and win, the thing to do is look for some factor that is cheating in your favour. If you took a pair of dice and started throwing sevens, one right or another, for the next couple of thousand years you'd begin to suspect they were loaded. Benedict said nothing. He just waited expectantly. There is only one thing that could have done it. Our ship. Laika said it quietly, without emphasis. What we know about the hyperspace, or superspace, or whatever it is we move through in ultradrive, is almost nothing. Coming out of it so near to a star might set up some sort of shock wave in normal space which would completely disrupt that star's internal balance, resulting in the liberation of unimaginably vast amounts of energy, causing that star to go nova. We can only assume that we ourselves were the fuse that set off that nova. Benedict stood up slowly. When he spoke, his voice was a choking whisper. You mean the sun? Sol might. Laika nodded. I don't say that it definitely would, but the probability is that we were the cause of the destruction of Alpha Centauri A, and therefore might cause the destruction of Sol in the same way. Benedict's voice was steady again. That means we can't go back again, doesn't it? Even if we're not positive, we can't take the chance. Not necessarily. We can get fairly close before we cut out the drive and come in the rest of the way at sublight speed. It'll take longer and we'll have to go on half or one-third rations, but we can do it. How far away? I don't know what the minimum distance is, but I do know how we can gauge a distance. Remember, neither Alpha Centauri B or C were detonated. We'll have to cut our drive at least as far away from Sol as they are from A. I see. The commander was silent for a moment, then. Very well, Dr. Leica. If that's the safest way, that's the only way. Benedict issued the orders. 
while Laika figured the exact point at which they must cut out the drive and how long the trip would take. The rations would have to be cut down accordingly. Commander Benedict's mind whirled around the monstrousness of the whole thing like some dizzy bee around a flower. What if there had been planets around Centauri A? What if they had been inhabited? Had he, all unwittingly, killed entire races of living, intelligent beings? But how could he have known? The dryad had never been tested before. It couldn't be tested inside the solar system. It was too fast. He and his crew had been volunteers, knowing that they might die when the drive went on. Suddenly Benedict gasped and slammed his fist down on the desk before him. Laika looked up. What's the matter, Commander? Suppose, came the answer, just suppose that we have the same effect on a star when we go into ultra drive as we do when we come out of it. Laika was silent for a moment, stunned by the possibility. There was nothing to say anyway. They could only wait. A little more than half a light year from Sol, when the ship reached the point where its occupants could see the light that had left their home sun more than seven months before, they watched it become suddenly, horribly brighter. A hundred thousand times brighter. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Dr. Komatevsky's Day by Fritz Lieber Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, February 1952 Narrated by Tom Trissel Before science, there was superstition. After science, there will be what? The biggest, most staggering, most final fact of them all. But it's all predicted here. It even names this century for the next reshuffling of the planets. Celeste Wolver looked up unwillingly at the book her friend Madge Carnap held aloft like a torch. She made out the ill-stamped title, The Dance of the Planets. There was no mistaking the time of its origin. Only paper from the twentieth century aged to that particularly nasty shade of brown. Indeed, the book seemed to Celeste a brown old witch resurrected from the last age of madness to confound a world growing sane, and she couldn't help shrinking back a trifle toward her husband Theodore. He tried to come to her rescue, only predicted in the vaguest way, as I understand it, Komatevsky claimed, on the basis of a lot of evidence drawn from folklore, that the planets and their moons trade positions every so often. As if they were playing going to Jerusalem or musical chairs, Celeste chimed in, but she couldn't make it sound funny. Jupiter was supposed to have started as the outermost planet, and is to end up in the orbit of Mercury, Theodore continued, while well, nothing at all like that has happened. But it's begun, Madge said with conviction. Phobos and Deimos have disappeared. You can't argue away that stubborn little fact. That was a trouble. You couldn't. Mars's two tiny moons had simply vanished during a period when, as was generally the case, the eyes of astronomy weren't on them. Just some hundred odd cubic miles of rock, the merest cosmic fly specks yet they had carried away with them the security of a whole world. Looking at the lovely garden landscape around her, Celeste Wolver felt that in a moment the shrubby hills would begin to roll like waves, the charmingly aimless paths twist like snakes and sink in the green sea, the sparsely placed skyscrapers dissolved into the misty clouds they pierced. People must have felt like this, she thought, when Aristarchus first hinted and Copernicus told them that the solid earth under their feet was fa falling dizzily through space. Only it's worse for us, because they couldn't see that anything had changed. We can. You need something to cling to, she heard Madge say, 
Dr. Komatevsky was the only person who had ever had an inkling that anything like this might happen. I was never a Komatevskyite before, hadn't even heard of the man. She said it almost apologetically. In fact, standing there so frank and anxious eyes, Madge looked anything but a fanatic, which made it much worse. Of course, there are several more convincing alternate explanations, Theodore began hesitantly, knowing very well that there weren't. If Phobos and Deimos had suddenly disintegrated, surely Mars base would have noticed something. Of course, there was the disordered space hypothesis, even if it was a little more than the chance phrase of a prominent physicist pounded upon by an eager journalist. And in any case, what sense of security were you left with if you admitted that moons and planets might explode or drop through unseen holes in space? So we ended up by taking a different tack. Besides, if Phobos and Deimos simply shot off somewhere, surely they'd have been picked up by now by scope or radar. Two balls of rock just a few miles in diameter? Madge questioned. Aren't they smaller than many of the asteroids? I'm no astronomer, but I think I'm right. And of course, she was. She swung the book under her arm. Phew, it's heavy, she observed, adding in slightly scandalized tones. Never been microfilmed. She smiled nervously and looked them up and down. Going to a party? she asked. Theodore's scarlet cloak and Celeste's green culottes and silver jacket justified the question but they shook their head. "'Just the normally flamboyant garb of the family,' Celeste said, while Theodore explained, "'As it happens, we're bound on business connected with the disappearance. We Wolvers practically constitute a subcommittee of the Congress for the discovery of new purposes, and since a lot of varied material comes to our attention, we're going to see if any of it correlates with this bit of astronomical sleight of hand.' Madge nodded give you something to do at any rate. Well, I must be off. The Buddhist temple has lent us their place for a meeting. She gave them a woeful grin. See you when the earth jumps. Theodore said to Celeste, Come on, dear, we'll be late. But Celeste didn't want to move too fast. You know, Teddy, she said uncomfortably, all this reminds me of those old myths where too much good fortune is a sure sign of coming disaster. It was just too much luck, our great-grandparents missing World War Three and getting the world government started a thousand years ahead of schedule. Luck like that couldn't last, evidently. Maybe we've gone too fast with a lot of things, like space flight and the deep shaft and— she hesitated a bit— complex marriages. I'm a woman. I want complete security. Where am I to find it? In me, Theodore said promptly. In you, Celeste questioned, walking slowly. But you're just one-third of my husband. Perhaps I should look for it in Edmund or Ivan. You angry with me about something? Of course not. But a woman wants her source of security whole. In a crisis like this, it's disturbing to have it divided. Well, we are a whole, and I believe— "'Indivisible family,' Theodore told her warmly. "'You're not suggesting, are you, "'that we're going to be punished for our polygamous sins "'by a cosmic catastrophe? "'Fire from heaven and all that?' "'Don't be silly. "'I just wanted to give you a picture of my feeling,' Celeste smiled. "'I guess none of us realised how much we've come to depend "'on the idea of unchanging scientific law. "'Knocks the props from under you. Theodore nodded emphatically. All the more reason to get a line on what's happening as quickly as possible. You know, it's fantastically far-fetched, but I think the experience of persons with extrasensory perception may give us a clue. During the past three or four days, there's been a remarkable similarity in the dreams of ESPs all over the planet. I'm going to present the evidence at the meeting. Celeste looked up at him. So that's why Rosalind's bringing Frieda's daughter. Dottie is your daughter, too, and Rosalind's, Theodore reminded her. No, 
just Frieda's, Celeste said bitterly. Of course, you may be the father, one third of a chance. Theodore looked at her sharply, but didn't comment. Anyway, Dotty will be there, he said, probably asleep by now. All the ESPs have suddenly seemed to need more sleep. As they talked, it had been growing darker, though the luminescence of the path kept it from being bothersome. And now the cloud rack parted to the east, showing a single red planet low on the horizon. Did you know, Theodore said suddenly, that in Gulliver's travels Dean Swift predicted that better telescopes would show Mars to have two moons? He got the sizes and distances and periods damned accurately, too one of the few really startling coincidences of reality in literature. "'Stop being eerie,' Celeste said sharply. But then she went on. "'Those names, Phobos and Deimos, the Greek, aren't they? What do they mean?' Theodore lost a step. "'Fear and terror,' he said unwillingly. "'Now don't go taking that for an omen.' Most of the mythological names of major and minor ancient gods had been taken. The bodies in the solar systems are named that way, of course, and these were about all that were available. It was true, but it didn't comfort him much. I am a god, Dotty was dreaming, and I want to be by myself and think. I and my god friends like to keep some of our thoughts secret but the other gods have forbidden us to. A little smile flickered across the lips of the sleeping girl, and the woman in gold tights and gold spangled jacket leaned forward thoughtfully. In her dignity and simplicity and straight-spined grace, she was rather like a circus mother watching her sick child before she went out for the trapeze act. I and my god friends sail off in our great round silver boats, Dotty went on dreaming. The other gods are angry and scared. They are frightened of the thoughts we may think in secret. They follow us to hunt us down. There are many more of them than of us. As Celeste and Theodore entered the committee room, Rosalind Wolver, a glitter of platinum against darkness, came in through the opposite door and softly shut it behind her. Frieda, a fair woman in blue robes, got up from the round table. Celeste turned away with outward casualness as Theodore kissed his two other wives. She was pleased to note that Edmund seemed impatient too. A figure in close-fitting black, unrelieved except for two red arrows at the collar, he struck her as embodying very properly the serious, fateful temper of the moment. He took two briefcases from his vest pocket and tossed them down on the table beside one of the microfilm projectors. "'I suggest we get started without waiting for Ivan,' he said. Frida frowned anxiously. "'It's ten minutes since he phoned from the deep space bar to say he was starting right away, and that's hardly a two minutes' walk.' Rosalind instantly started toward the outside door. "'I'll check,' she explained. "'Oh, Frida. I've set the mic so you'll hear if Dotty calls. Edmund threw up his hands. Very well, then, he said and walked over, switched on the picture, and stared out moodily. Theodore and Frieda got out their briefcases, switched on projectors, and began silently checking through their material. Celeste fiddled with the TV and got a newscast but she found her eyes didn't want to absorb the blocks of print that rather swiftly succeeded each other, so after a few moments she shrugged impatiently and switched to audio. At the noise the others looked around at her with surprise and some irritation, but in a few moments they were also listening. The two rocket ships sent out from Mars base to explore the orbital positions of Phobos and Deimos, that is, the volume of space they'd be occupying if their positions had remained normal, Report finding masses of dust and larger debris. The two masses of fine debris are moving in the same orbits and at the same velocities as the two vanished moons, and occupy roughly the same volumes of space, though the mass of material is hardly a hundredth of that of the moons. 
Physicists have ventured no statements as to whether this constitutes a confirmation of the disintegration hypothesis. However, we're mightily pleased at this news here. There's a marked lessening of tension. The finding of the debris, solid, tangible stuff, seems to lift the whole affair out of the supernatural miasma in which some of us have been tempted to plunge it. One hundredth of the moon has been found. The rest will also be... Edmund had turned his back on the window. Frida and Theodore had switched off their projectors. Meanwhile, earthlings are going about their business with a minimum of commotion, meeting with considerable calm the strange threat to the fabric of their solar system. Many, of course, are assembled in churches in humanist temples. Komatevskyites have staged helicopter processions at Washington, Peking, Pretoria, and Christiania, demanding that instant preparation be made for, and I quote, Earth's coming leap through space. They have also formally challenged all astronomers to produce an explanation other than the one contained in that strange book so recently conjured from oblivion, The Dance of the Planets. That about winds up the story for the present. There are no new reports from interplanetary radar, astronomy, or the other rocket ships searching in the extended Mars volume. Nor have any statements been issued by the various groups working on the problem in astrophysics, cosmic ecology, the Congress for the Discovery of New Purposes, and so forth. Meanwhile, however, we can take courage from the words of a poem written even before Dr. Tom Komatevsky's book. The earth is not the steadfast place we landsmen build upon. From deep to deep she varies pace, and while she comes is gone. Beneath my feet I feel her smooth bulk heave and dip, with velvet plunge and soft upreel, she swings and steadies to her keel like a gallant, gallant ship. While the TV voice intoned the poem, growing richer as emotion caught it up, Celeste looked around her at the others. Frida, with her touch of feminine helplessness showing more than ever through her businesslike poise, Theodore, leaning forward from his scarlet cloak thrown back, smiling the half-smile with which he seemed to face even the unknown. Black Edmund, masking a deep uncertainty with a strong show of decisiveness. In short, her family. She knew their every quirk and foible, and yet now they seemed to her a million miles away, figures seen through the wrong end of a telescope. Were they really a family, strong sources of mutual strength and security to each other? Or had they merely been playing family, experimenting with their notions of complex marriage like a bunch of silly adolescents, butterflies taking advantage of good weather to wing together in a glamorous artificial dance, until outraged nature decided to wipe them out? As the poem was ending, Celeste saw the door open, and Rosalind came slowly in. The golden woman's face was white as the paths she had been treading. Just then the TV voice quickened with shock. News! Lunar Observatory 1 reports that, although Jupiter is just about to pass behind the sun, a good coronagraph of the planet has been obtained. Checked and rechecked, it admits of only one interpretation, which Lunar 1 feels duty-bound to release. Jupiter's fourteen moons are no longer visible. The chorus of remarks with which the Woolworths would otherwise have received this was checked by one thing. The fact that Rosalind seemed not to hear it. Whatever was on her mind prevented even that incredible statement from penetrating. She walked shakily to the table and put down a briefcase, one end of which was smudged with dirt. Without looking at them, she said, Ivan left the deep space bar twenty minutes ago, said he was coming straight here. On my way back, I searched the path. Midway, I found this half buried in the dirt. I had to tug to get it out, almost as if it had been cemented into the ground. Do you feel how the dirt seems to be in the leather, as if it had lain for years in the grave? By now the others were fingering the small case of microfilms they had seen so many times in Ivan's competent hands. What Rosalind said was true. It had a gritty, unwholesome feel to it. Also, 
it felt strangely heavy. "'And see what's written on it,' she added. They turned it over, scrawled with white pencil in big, hasty, frantic letters were two words, GOING DOWN. The other gods, Dotty dreamt, are coming the whole universe for us. We have escaped them many times, but now our tricks are almost used up. There are no doors going out of the universe, and our boats are silver beacons to the hunters. So we decide to disguise them in the only way they can be disguised. It is our last chance. Edmund rapped the table to gain the family's attention. I say we've done everything we can for the moment to find Ivan. We've made a thorough local search. A wider one, which we can't conduct personally, is in progress. All helpful agencies have been alerted and descriptions are being broadcast. I suggest we get on with the business of the evening, which may very well be connected with Ivan's disappearance. One by one, the others nodded and took their places at the round table. Celeste made a great effort to throw off the feeling of unreality that had engulfed her and focus attention on her microfilms. "'I'll take over Ivan's notes,' she heard Edmund say. "'They're mainly about the deep shaft.' "'How far have they got with that?' Frida asked idly. Twenty-five miles?' "'Nearer thirty, I believe.' Edmund answered, and still going down. At those last two words they all looked up quickly. Then their eyes went toward Ivan's briefcase. "'Our trick has succeeded,' Dotty dreamt. "'The other gods have passed our hiding place a dozen times without noticing. They searched the universe for us many times in vain. They finally decide that we have found a door going out of the universe.' Yet they fear us all the more. They think of us as devils who will some day return through the door to destroy them. So they watch everywhere. We lie quietly, smiling in our camouflaged boats, yet hardly daring to move or think, for fear that the faintest echoes of our doings will give them a clue. Hundreds of millions of years pass by. They seem to us no more than drugged hours in a prison. Theodore rubbed his eyes and pushed his chair back from the table. We need a break. Frida agreed wearily. We've gone through everything. Good idea, Edmund said briskly. I think we've hit on several crucial points along the way and half disentangled them from the great mass of inconsequential material. I'll finish up that part of the job right now and present my case when we're all a bit fresher. Say, half an hour? Theodore nodded heavily, pushing up from his chair and hitching his cloak over a shoulder. "'I'm going out for a drink,' he informed them. After several hesitant seconds, Rosalind quietly followed him. Frida stretched out on a couch and closed her eyes. Edmund scanned microfilms tirelessly, every now and then setting one aside. Celeste watched him for a minute then sprang up and started toward the room where Dotty was asleep. But midway she stopped. Not my child, she thought bitterly. Frida's her mother, Rosalind her nurse. I'm nothing at all, just one of the husband's girlfriends, a lady of uneasy virtue in a dissolving world. But then she straightened her shoulders and went on. Rosalind didn't catch up with Theodore. Her footsteps were silent, and he never looked back along the path whose feeble white glow rose only knee-high, lighting a low strip of shrub and mossy tree trunk to either side, no more. It was a little chilly. She drew on her gloves, but she didn't hurry. In fact, she fell farther and farther behind the dipping tail of his scarlet cloak and his plodding red shoes, which seemed to move disembodied like those in a fairy tale. When she reached the point where she had found Ivan's briefcase, she stopped altogether. A breeze rustled the leaves, and moistly brushing her cheek brought forest scents of rotten mould. After a bit, 
she began to hear the furtive scurryings and scuttlings of forest creatures. She looked around her half-heartedly, suddenly realising the futility of her quest. What clues could she hope to find in this knee-high twilight? And they thoroughly combed the place early in the night. Without warning, an eerie tingling went through her, and she was seized by horror of the cold, grainy earth underfoot, an ancestral terror from the days when men shivered at ghost stories about graves and tombs. A tiny detail persisted in bulking larger and larger in her mind. The unnaturalness of the way the earth had impregnated the corner of Ivan's briefcase, almost as if dirt and leather coexisted in the same space. She remembered the queer way the partly buried briefcase had resisted her first tug, like a rooted plant. She felt cowed by the mysterious night about her, and literally dwarfed as if she had grown several inches shorter. She roused herself and started forward. Something held her feet. They were ankle-deep in the path. While she looked in fright and horror, they began to sink still lower into the ground. She plunged frantically, trying to jerk loose. She couldn't. She had the panically feeling that the earth had not only trapped but invaded her, that its molecules were creeping up between the molecules of her flesh, that the two were becoming one. And she was sinking faster, now knee-deep, thigh-deep, hip-deep, waist-deep. She beat at the powdery path with her hands and threw her body from side to side in agonised frenzy like some sinner frozen in the ice of the innermost circle of the ancient's hell. And always the sense of the dark, grainy tide rose inside as well as around her. She'd thought he'd just have had time to scribble that note on his briefcase and toss it away. She jerked off a glove, leaned out as fast as she could, and made a frantic effort to drive its finger into the powdery dark path. Then the earth mounted to her chin, her nose, and covered her eyes. She expected blackness, but it was as if the light of the path stayed with her, making a little glow all around. She saw roots, pebbles, black rot, worn tunnels, worms, tier on tier of them, her vision penetrating the solid ground, and at the same time the knowledge that these same sorts of things were coursing up through her. And still she continued to sink, at a speed that increased, as if the law of gravitation applied to her in a diminished way. She dropped from black soil through grey clay and into pale limestone. Her tortured, rock-permeated lungs sucked at rock and drew in air. She wondered madly if a volume of air were falling with her through the stone. A glitter of quartz, the momentary openness of a foot-high cavern with a trickle of water, and then she was sliding down a black basalt column, half inside it, half inside gold-flecked ore, then just black basalt, and always faster. It grew hot, then hotter, as if she were approaching the mythical eternal fires. At first glance, Theodore thought the deep space bar was empty. Then he saw a figure hunched monkey-like on the last stool, almost lost in the blue shadows, while behind the bar, her crystal dress blending with the tears of sparkling glasses, stood a grave-eyed young girl who could hardly have been fifteen. The TV was saying, In addition, a number of mysterious disappearances of high-rating individuals have been reported. These are thought to be cases of misunderstanding, illusory apprehension, and impulsive travelling, a result of the unusual stresses of the time. Finally, a few suggestible individuals in various parts of the globe, especially the Indian Peninsula, have declared themselves to be gods and in some way responsible for current events. It is thought... The girl switched off the TV and took Theodore's order, explaining casually, Joe wanted to go to a Kometsevskyite meeting, so I took over for him. When she had prepared Theodore's highball, she announced, 
I'll have a drink with you, gentlemen, and squeezed herself a glass of pomegranate juice. The monkey-like figure muttered, Scotch and soda, then turned toward Edmund and asked, And what is your reaction to all this, sir? Theodore recognised the shrunken, wrinkled-seamed face. It was Colonel Fortescue, a military antique, long retired from the Peace Patrol and reputed to have seen actual fighting in the last age of madness. Now, for some reason, the face sported a knowing smile. Theodore shrugged. Just then the TV Big News light blinked blue and the girl switched on audio. The colonel winked at Theodore. Confirming the disappearance of Jupiter's moons, but two other utterly fantastic reports have just been received. First, Lunar Observatory 1 says that it is visually tracking 14 small bodies which it believes may be the lost moons of Jupiter. They are moving outward from the solar system at an incredible velocity and are already beyond the orbit of Saturn. The colonel said, Ah! Second, Palomar reports a large number of dark bodies approaching the solar system at an equally incredible velocity. They are about the twice the distance of Pluto, but closing in fast. We will be on the air with further details as soon as possible. The colonel said, Aha! Theodore stared at him. The old man's self-satisfied poise was almost amusing. Are you a Komatevskyite? Theodore asked him. The colonel laughed. Of course not, my boy. Those poor people are fumbling in the dark. Don't you see what's happened? Frankly, no. The colonel leaned toward Theodore and whispered gruffly, The divine plan! God is a military strategist, naturally. Then he lifted the scotch and soda in his claw-like hand and took a satisfying swallow. I knew it all along, of course, he went on musingly. But this last news makes it as plain as a rocket blast, at least to anyone who knows military strategy. Look here, my boy. Suppose you were commanding a fleet and got wind of the enemy's approach. What would you do? Why, you'd send your scouts and destroyers fanning out toward them. Behind that screen, you'd mask your heavy ships. Then— You don't mean to imply— Theodore interrupted. The girl behind the barn looked at them both cryptically. "'Of course I do,' the colonel cut in sharply. "'It's a war between the forces of good and evil. "'The bright suns and planets are on one side, the dark on the other. "'The moons are the destroyers, Jupiter and Saturn are the big battleships, "'while we're on a heavy cruiser, I'm proud to say. "'We'll probably go into action soon. "'Be a corking fight, what? "'And all by divine strategy!' "'He chuckled and took another big drink. "'Theodore looked at him sourly.' The girl behind the bar polished a glass and said nothing. Dotty suddenly began to turn and toss, and a look of terror came over her sleeping face. Celeste leaned forward apprehensively. The child's lips worked, and Celeste made out the sleepy, fuzzy words. "'They found out where we're hiding. They're coming to get us. No, please, no!' Celeste's reactions were mixed. She felt worried about Dotty, and at the same time almost in terror of her, as if the little girl were an agent of supernatural forces. She told herself that this fear was an expression of her own hostility, yet she didn't really believe it. She touched the child's hand. Dotty's eyes opened, without making Celeste feel she had quite come awake. After a bit, she looked at Celeste, and her little lips parted in a smile. Hello, she said sleepily. I've been having such funny dreams. Then after a pause, frowning, I really am a god, you know. It feels very queer. Yes, dear, Celeste prompted uneasily. Shall I call Frida? The smile left Dotted's lips. Why do you act so nervous around me? She asked. Don't you love me, mummy? Celeste started at the word. Her throat closed, then very slowly her face broke into a radiant smile. "'Of course I do, darling. I love you very much.' Dotty nodded happily, her eyes already closed again. There was a sudden flurry of excited voices beyond the door. Celeste heard her name called. She stood up. "'I'm going to have to go out and talk with the others,' she said. 
If you want me, dear, just call. Yes, Mummy. Edmund rapped for attention. Celeste, Frida, and Theodore glanced around at him. He looked more frightfully strained, they realised, than even they felt. His expression was a study in suppressed excitement, but there were also signs of a knowledge that was almost too overpowering for a human being to bear. His voice was clipped, rapid. I think it's about time we stopped worrying about our own affairs and thought of those of the solar system, partly because I think they have a direct bearing on the disappearances of Ivan and Rosalind. As I told you, I've been sorting out the crucial items from the material we've been presenting. There are roughly four of those items, as I see it. It's rather like a mystery story. I wonder if, hearing those four clues, you will come to the same conclusion I have. The others nodded. First, there are the latest reports from Deep Shaft, which, as you know, has been sunk to investigate deep earth conditions. At approximately 29 miles below the surface, the Delvers have encountered a metallic obstruction which they have tentatively named the Durosphere. It resists their hardest drills, their strongest corrosives. They have extended a side tunnel to that level for a quarter of a mile. Delicate measurements made possible by the mirror-smooth metal surface show that the Durosphere has a slight curvature that is almost exactly equal to the curvature of the Earth itself. The suggestion is that deep borings made anywhere in the world would encounter the Durosphere at the same depth. Second, the movements of the moons of Mars and Jupiter, and particularly the debris left behind by the moons of Mars, granting Phobos and Demons had Durospheres proportional in size to that of Earth, then the debris would roughly equal in amount the material in those two Durospheres' rocky envelopes. The suggestion is that the two Durospheres suddenly burst from their envelopes with such titanic velocity as to leave those disrupted envelopes behind. It was deadly quiet in the committee room. Thirdly, the disappearances of Ivan and Rosalind, and especially the baffling hint from Ivan's message in one case and Rosalind's downward-pointing glove in the other, that they were both somehow drawn into the depths of the earth. Finally, the dreams of the ESPs, which agree overwhelmingly in the following points. A group of beings separate themselves from a godlike and telepathic race because they insist on maintaining a degree of mental privacy. They flee in great boats or ships of some sort. They are pursued on such a scale that there is no hiding place for them anywhere in the universe. In some manner they successfully camouflage their ships, eons pass, and their still fanatical pursuers do not penetrate their secret. Then, suddenly, they are detected. Edmund waited. Do you see what I'm driving at? he asked hoarsely. He could tell from their looks that the others did, but couldn't bring themselves to put it into words. I suppose it's the time scale and the value scale that are so hard for us to accept, he said softly. Much more, even, than the size scale. The thought that there are creatures in the universe to whom the whole career of man, in fact, the whole career of life, is no more than a few thousand or hundred thousand years, and to whom man is no more than a minor stage property, a trifling part of a clever job of camouflage. This time he went on. Fantasy writers have at times hinted all sorts of odd things about the earth, that it might even be a kind of single living creature, or honeycombed with inhabited caverns the and so on. End. But I don't Subscribe know that any of them have ever suggested daily that stories the Earth, of futures together with past, all the planets and moons of the and solar now, system, might be for the next story. In a whisper, Frida finished for him. A camouflaged fleet of gigantic spherical spaceships. Your guess happens to be the precise truth. At that familiar yet dreadly unfamiliar voice, all four of them swung toward the inner door. Dotty was standing there, a sleep-stupefied little girl with a blanket caught up around her and dragging behind, their own daughter, but in her eyes was a look from which they cringed. She said, I am a creature somewhat older than what your geologists call the Archaeozoic Era. I am speaking to you through a number of telepathically sensitive individuals among your kind. In each case, 
My thoughts suit themselves to your level of comprehension. I inhabit the disguised and jetless spaceship which is your Earth. Celeste swayed a step forward. Baby, she implored. Dotty went on without giving her a glance. It is true that we planted the seeds of life on some of these planets simply as a part of our camouflage, just as we gave them a suitable environment for each, and it is true that now we must let most of that life be destroyed. Our hiding place has been discovered, our pursuers are upon us, and we must make one last effort to escape or do battle, since we firmly believe that the principle of mental privacy to which we have devoted our existence is perhaps the greatest good in the whole universe. But it is not true that we look with contempt upon you. Our whole race is deeply devoted to life, wherever it may come into being, and it is our rule never to interfere with its development. That was one of the reasons we made life a part of our camouflage. It would make our pursuers reluctant to examine these planets too closely. Yes, we had always cherished you and watched your evolution with interest from our hidden lairs. We may even unconsciously have shaped your development in certain ways, trying constantly to educate you away from war and finally succeeding, which may have given the betraying clue to our pursuers. Your planets must be burst asunder, this particular planet in the area of the Pacific, so that we may have our last chance to escape. Even if we did not move, our pursuers would destroy you with us. We cannot invite you inside our ships, not for lack of space, but because you could never survive the vast accelerations to which you would be subjected. You would, you see, need very special accommodations, of which we have enough only for a few. Those few we will take with us, as the seed from which a new human race may, if we ourselves somehow survive, be born. Rosalind and Ivan stared dumbly at each other across the egg-shaped silver room, without apparent entrance or exit, in which they were sprawled. But their thoughts were no longer of the thirty-odd mile journeys down through solid earth, or of how cool it was after the heat of the passage, or of how grotesque it was to be trapped here, the fragment of a marriage. They were both listening to the voice that spoke inside their minds. In a few minutes your bodies will be separated into layers, one atom thick, capable of being shelved or stored in such a way as to endure almost infinite accelerations. Single cells will cover acres of space. But do not be alarmed. The process will be painless, and each particle will be catalogued for future assembly. Your consciousness will endure throughout the process. Rosalind looked at her gold-shod toes. She was wondering, Will they go first, or my head? Or will I be peeled like an apple? She looked at Ivan and knew he was thinking the same thing. Up in the committee room, the other wolvers slumped around the depot. Only little Dotty sat straight and staring, speechless and unanswering, quite beyond their reach, like a telephone off the hook and with the connection open, but no voice from the other end. They had just switched off the TV after listening to a confused medley of denials, prayers, Komatevskyite chatterings, and a few astonishingly realistic comments on the possibility of survival. These last pointed out that, on the side of the earth opposite the Pacific, the convulsions would come slowly when the entombed spaceships burst forth, provided, as seemed the case, that it moved without jets or reaction. It would be as if the Earth's vast core simply vanished. Gravity would diminish abruptly to a fraction of its former value. The empty envelope of rock and water and air would slowly fall together, though at the same time the air would begin to escape from the debris because there would no longer be the mass required to hold it. However, there might be definite chances of temporary and even prolonged survival for individuals in strong hermetically sealed structures, such as submarines and spaceships. The few spaceships on Earth were reported to have blasted off or be preparing to leave with as many passengers as could be carried. But most persons, apparently, could not contemplate action of any sort. They could only sit and think, like the wolvers. 
A faint smile relaxed Celeste's face. She was thinking, How beautiful! It means the death of the solar system, which is a horrifying subjective concept. Objectively, though, it would be a more awesome sight than any human being has ever seen or ever could see. It's an absurd and even brutal thing to wish, but I wish I could see the whole cataclysm from beginning to end. It would make death seem very small, a tiny personal event. Dotty's face was losing its blank expression, becoming intent and alarmed. We are in contact with our pursuers, she said in the familiar, unfamiliar voice. Negotiations are now going on. There seems to be, there is a change in them. Where they were harsh and vindictive before, they are now gentle and conciliatory. She paused, the alarm on her childish features pinching into anxious uncertainty. Our pursuers have always been shrewd. The change in them may be false, intended merely to lull us into allowing them to come close enough to destroy us. We must not fall into the trap by growing hopeful. They leaned forward, clutching hands, watching the little face as though it were a television screen. Celeste had the wild feeling that she was listening to a communique from a war so unthinkably vast and violent, between opponents so astronomically huge and nearly immortal, that she felt not, no more than a reasoning amoeba, and then realised with an explosive urge to laugh that that was exactly the situation. No, said Dotty. Her eyes began to glow. They have changed. During the eons in which we lay sealed away and hidden from them, knowing nothing of them, they rebelled against the tyranny of a communal mind to which no faults were private, the tyranny that we ourselves fled to escape. They come not to destroy us, but to welcome us back to a society that we and they can make truly great. Frida collapsed to a chair trembling between laughter and hysterical weeping. Theodore looked as blank as Dotty had while waiting for words to speak. Edmund sprang to the picture window, Celeste toward the TV set. Climbing shakily out of the chair, Frida stumbled to the picture window and peered out beside Edmund. She saw lights bobbing along the paths with a wild excitement. On the TV screen, Celeste watched two brightly lit ships spinning in the sky. Whether human spaceships or Phobos and Deimos come to help Earth rejoice, she couldn't tell. Dotty spoke again, this joy in her strange voice forcing them to return. And you, dear children, creatures of our camouflage, we welcome you. Whatever your future career on these planets or like ones, into the society of enlightened worlds. You need not feel small and alone and helpless ever again, for we shall always be with you. The outer door opened. Ivan and Rosalind reeled in, drunkenly smiling, arm in arm. Like rockets, Rosalind blurted happily, we came through the durosphere and solid rock, shot up right to the surface. They didn't have to take us along. Ivan added with a bleary grin. But you know that already, don't you? They're too good to let you live in fear, so they must have told you by now. Yes, we know, said Theodore. They must be almost godlike in their goodness. I feel calm. Edmund nodded soberly. Calmer than I've ever felt before. It's knowing, I suppose, that, well, we're not alone. Dotty blinked and looked around and smiled at them with all a holy little girl smile. "'Oh, Mummy,' she said, and it was impossible to tell whether she spoke as to Frida or Rosalind or Celeste. "'I've just had the funniest dream.' "'No, darling,' said Rosalind gently. "'It's we who have had the dream. We've just awakened.' The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Sons of Japheth by Richard Wilson Originally published in Infinity, December 1956 
narrated by Tom Trissel. Pilot Officer Roy Vangen happened to be spaceborne when the Earth exploded. In that way, he escaped the annihilation along with one other man, revered old Dr. Garfield Gar, who was in the space station. Roy had backed well off in preparation for a Mark X dive on Kabul, which the enemy had lately taken over. He had one small omnibon left in his racks, and Kabul had seemed to be about the right size. But then the destruction of Earth changed his plans. He watched, expressionless, as the planet exploded. He shrugged. There was nothing to do now but go see Dr. Gar. Roy's foe-scope clamoured insistently, and he tensed, thinking a space-born enemy was on him, but it was only a piece of exploding Earth stumbling by. Dr. Gar was alone in the space station because all able-bodied men had been called to fight World War V. The governments of Earth, in a rare moment of conscience during the short truce, had agreed that Dr. Gar, as the embodiment of all earthly knowledge, should be protected from harm. Pilot Officer Roy Vangen didn't receive as warm a reception from old Dr. Gar as he might have, considering that they were the only two people left. The old man was combing his white beard with his fingers and didn't offer to shake hands. Well, said Roy as he diffused his bomb and secured his single-seater in the space lock, I guess it's all over. Scarcely a historic statement, Dr. Gar said but it describes the situation. If you don't have anything for me to do, I'd just as soon have a drink. They usually let me have a stiff one after I complete a mission. Dr. Gar examined the hard young pilot from under shaggy white eyebrows. I do have another mission for you, but you can have a drink first. Peach brandy is all that's left. That'll be fine, Roy said. I was never particular. Then you're my man. Dr. Gar said, giving him a deep look. Because I want you to go back in time and destroy humanity. Whatever you say, Roy's training showed. But if I may comment, wouldn't that be superfluous? Except for you and me, the human race is finished. We've achieved our objective, he spoke without irony. Never my objective. I'm not a scholar, and I mean no offence, Roy said but I believe it was the coordinated spatial theory you announced back in 06 that made it possible. Misapplication, Dr. Gar said wearily, not wanting to go into it further for such an audience, though, he thought, he'd never have another. Come into my study and have your brandy. I still don't understand, Roy said later. He reached tentatively for the bottle. When the old man made no objection, he poured a second stiff one. "'You want me to go back in time and wipe out all human life,' Roy said. "'I assume you'll tell me when and where. "'All right. That would destroy our ancestors, and so we'd cease to exist too. "'Wouldn't it be simpler to kill ourselves now? "'That is, if you see no point to a further existence.' Old Dr. Gar watched the other remnant of earthly life twirl the brandy and the goblet. He looked at the view screen. It showed a panorama of rock dust and steam where Earth had been. "'You forget that we have annihilated everything,' Dr. Gar said, gazing pensively at the screen. "'Mankind, the animals, plant life, and the tiny things that creep the Earth or swim the waters. Your mission will be more selective.' Selective? How? You'll destroy man, but the rest will live. They may evolve into something better. If you say so, Doctor. Roy's devotion to duty was a well-worn path. Assuming you have the machine and I can operate it. The machine is merely an attachment. It will plug into the instrument panel of your spacecraft. It operates automatically. Good enough. You always were a wizard, these things. How far back do I go, and who do I kill? I want you to strafe the Ark, exercising care not to hurt any of the animals, said old Dr. Garfield Gar. Noah's Ark? Pilot Officer Roy Vangen asked, 
You mean during the flood? Yes, I've computed it exactly. You won't have to worry about getting there at the wrong time. You mean after the forty days rain, so I'll have good visibility? good -o. He agreed readily, and he'd do as the doctor said, of course, but he permitted a trace of scepticism in his inflection and a searching look into his goblet. No, not the fortieth day, Dr. Gar said, but in what we are told was the six hundred and first year in the first month, the first day of the month. The animals need dry land. I have it all figured out. I hope so. I mean, I'm sure you have. You're the doctor, of course, but wasn't there some doubt about the accuracy of the old book? I didn't know you were a fundamentalist. Am I not the repository of all human knowledge? Dr. Gar asked. He was not a bit angry with Roy Vangen. Am I not the last best hope? Has not all else failed us? Well, sure. Did not the Noahic covenant under which human government was established fail? Has not Japhetic science been our undoing? Roy looked lost. I'm no scholar, Doctor. Agreed. Perhaps you'll grant that I am. He looked with a supreme calm at the young pilot. I am your new intelligence officer, and you are merely my striking arm. Help yourself to another brandy, son. Maybe I'd better not. I don't want to goof the mission. There's time. You'll want some sleep first. All right. I suppose I'll need a steady hand to murder Noah and the rest. And Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, said Dr. Carr, and the three wives of his sons with them, as it was written, especially Japheth. But not the animals, remember? I understand that. If you think the Ten Commandments don't apply, whichever one of them it was, they were an element of the Mosaic Covenant, it too failed. Perhaps the Garrick Covenant, if I may be so vain, will endure. The waters covered the earth. A moment ago, before he activated the attachment, Pilot Officer Roy Vangen's spacecraft had been plunging toward the vortex of a ragged ball of dust and vapour, the destroyed Earth of World War V. Now, in the Adamic year 601, or was it the Edenic? He couldn't remember, though Dr. Gar had let him study the book. The waters stretched everywhere. Ahead the sun glinted in reflection from something rising above the surface. Ararat? He made out the twin peaks. He throttled back to scarcely more than Mark I and flew over them high. His second pass took him back along his own vapour trail. This time he spotted the tiny surface craft making for the solitary bit of land. He had to hand it to Dr. Gar. The old boy's space-time grid had hit it right on the button. Roy was too high to distinguish details, but he imagined that Noah and his family would be on deck, full of the wonder of Mount Ararat rising, as promised, from the sea but there was another wonder, the vapour trails that stretched for miles across the upper air. Did they, down there on the ark, think them a sign of the Lord? Roy smiled ironically. They were the sign of the Lord Gar and of his servant, Pilot Officer Vangen, come to blast them into eternity and change the future, to give the animals a chance. Who would chronicle his role as a rearranging angel the unheavenly host about to gather up in violence the drifting souls below. Who, he wondered, some simian scribe, some unborn elephant prophet, an insected scholar destined to evolve from among the creeping things that would inherit the earth. Or perhaps the written word would die unborn under the fiery hail of his guns. No matter. These questions and more had been anticipated by Dr. Gar. Soon now, at the end of Roy's strafing run, it would be up to history to begin assembling the answers. He slowed to Muck Minus and set out wings. He would have to dip close to see if the entire Ark's complement was on deck. The job had to be done right, or Earth was kaput. 
Nothing personal, Noah, old boy. There they were, on the starboard side of the top deck, well out from under the pitch of the roof, craning their necks for a look at this miracle in the sky where they had expected to see only a returning dove. Behold, Roy cried out, I bring you tidings, but not the tidings of the dove. I am a lost raven returned, the raven of death. My tidings are of the new future which your descendants will not know, and so will not doom. The frightened, upturned faces were far behind, and he was talking to himself. Hear me, Noah, for I am come to destroy you, and with you your seeds of self-destruction. These are the tidings I bring from the future that has ceased to exist because you existed, the future that will exist once more when you cease to. He heeled the spacecraft over and back. No more speech, as he told himself, though he had studied the book in fascination. He was a killer, not a philosopher. He would have to make his strafing run low. If he dived on his target, his bullets would go into the holes and kill the animals. He roared at the ark a few feet above the waves. They were all together in a clump, the eight of them. Farewell, Noah, he thought, as his thumbs pressed on the death-dealing button. Farewell, Noah, and Noah's wife. Farewell, Ham, and Ham's wife, and unborn sons. Farewell, Canaan, and Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut. Farewell, Shem, and unborn Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. And farewell, Japheth, father of sons of science. Farewell, Goma, and Magog, and Medai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. Farewell, all tribes. Make way for the animal kingdom in the Garrick Covenant. He had made three passes, and now he zoomed into the sky. He had destroyed humanity and changed the future. Or had he? He'd be dead too if he had, gone like the snap of a finger with a last gasp from the ark. He had killed his ancestors. He had killed everybody's ancestors. But he existed still. Where was the paradox that Dr. Gar had overlooked? The ark had drifted closer to the shore. He circled it and counted the lifeless bodies lying in red stains on the gopher wood of the deck. Eight. Then he noticed the change. The backs of his hands were hairier. His shoes were binding him. When he kicked them off, his agile toes curled comfortably around the control pedals. He had a glimpse of a hairy, flat-nosed face reflected in the instrument panel. It laughed, and the sound came out a simian yap. But for all that, he was still a sentient being. His control of the spacecraft was as expert as before. It hadn't worked. Do you hear, Dr. Gar? he thought. It's a flop. I goofed the mission. We're all dead no matter what. I give you a new commandment, man who would be God. Thou shalt not tamper with time. He had changed the future and in the future he himself had been changed, but not enough. Somewhere below in the hold of the Ark were his ancestors who had evolved along a new path in the new future. The evolution had been slower, perhaps, but it had been as sure, external appearances notwithstanding. Somewhere in the far new future, he was sure, there was a simian Dr. Gar looking down in solitude on the remains of Earth, the ark had touched the land. The animals, his fellow creatures, were beginning to go forth, two by two, onto the shore of Ararat. His foescope set up a clamour. There in the sky was a new thing, a spacecraft like his, yet unlike it. It looked deadlier, more purposeful. Ignoring him, it was diving out of the unknowable future to destroy its own past. He watched in professional admiration 
as his fellow pilots screamed a knurling for the Ark in sacrificial completion of the mission he himself had failed to accomplish. Death to the animals, too, from an animal pilot. He knew then that Earth would not die. It might circle lifeless for eons, waiting to welcome the foot or paw or tentacle of others from outside. But it would be there, intact and serene. Even as the mountain-shattering explosion came, and he himself ceased to exist, he knew. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Homecoming by Miguel Hidalgo Originally published in Worlds of If, April 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel The large horse plodded slowly over the shifting sand. The rider was of medium size with huge strong hands and seemingly hollow eyes. Strange eyes, alive and aflame. They had no place in the dust-cake tired body. Yet there they were, seeking, always seeking searching the clear horizon, and never seeming to find what they sought. The horse moved faster now. They were nearing a river. The water would be welcome on tired bodies and dry throats. He spurred his horse, and when they reached the water's edge, he dismounted and unsaddled the horse. Then both man and horse plunged headlong into the waiting torrent deep into the cool embrace of the clear liquid. They soaked it into their paws and drank deeply of it, feeling life going once more through their veins. Satisfied, they lifted themselves from the water, and the man lay down on the yellow sand of the river bank to sleep. When he awoke, the sun was almost setting. The bright shafts of red light spilled across the sky, making the mountains silent scarlet shadows on the face of the rippling water. Quickly he gathered driftwood and built a small fire. From his pack he removed some of the coffee he had found in one of the ruined cities. He brought water from the river in the battered coffee pot he had salvaged, and while he waited for it to boil he went to his horse, Conqueror, stroking his mane and whispering in his ear, then he led him silently to a grassy slope where he hobbled him and left him for the night. In the fading light he ate the hard beef jerky and drank the scalding coffee. Refreshed and momentarily content, he sat staring into the dying fire, seeing the bright glowing coals as living fingers clutching at the wood in consuming embrace, taking all and returning nothing but ashes. Slowly his eyelids yielded, his body sagged, and blood seemed to fill his brain, bathing it in a gentle warm flood. He slept, his brain slept. But the portion of his brain called memory stirred. It was all alone, all else was at rest. Images began to appear, drawn from inexhaustible files, wherein are kept all thoughts past, present, and future. It was the night before he was to go overseas. World War Three had been declared, and he had enlisted, receiving his old rank of captain. He was with his wife in the living room of their home. They had put the children to bed, their sons, and now sat on the couch, watching the blazing fire. It was then that he had showed it to her, I've got something to tell you, and something to show you. He had removed the box from his pocket and opened it, and heard her cry of surprised joy. Oh, a ring, and it's a diamond, too! She cried in her rich, happy voice, 
which always seemed to send a thrill through his body. It's for you. So long as you wear it, I'll come back, even from the dead, if need be. Read the inscription. She held the ring up to the light and read aloud, It is forever. Then she had slipped the ring on her finger and her arms around him. He held her very close, feeling the warmth from her body flowing into his and making him oblivious to everything except that she was there in his arms and that he was sinking deep, deep into a familiar sea where he had been many times before, but each time found something new and unexplored, some vastly different emotion he could never quite explain. Wait, she cried, I've something for you too. She took off the locket she wore around her neck and held it up to the shimmering light, letting it spin at the end of its chain. It caught the shadows of the fire and reflected them, greatly magnified, over the room. It was in the shape of a star, encrusted with emeralds, with one large ruby in the centre. When he opened it, he found a picture of her in one side and in the other a picture of the children. He took her in his arms again and loosened her long black hair, burying his face in it for a moment. Then he kissed her and instantly was drawn down into the abyss which seemed to have no beginning or any end. The next morning had been bleak and grey. The mist clung to the wet sodden ground and the air was heavy in his lungs. He had driven off in the jeep the army had sent for him, watching her there on the porch until the mist swirled around her feet and she ran back into the house and slammed the door. His cold fingers found the locket, making a little bulge under his uniform, and the touch of it seemed to warm the blood in his veins. Three days later they had landed in Spain, merged with another division, then crossed the Pyrenees into France and finally to Paris, where the fighting had begun. Already the city was a silent graveyard, littered with the rubble of towers and cathedrals which had once been great. Three years later, they were on the road to Moscow. Over a thousand miles lay behind, a dead man on every foot of those miles. Yet victory was near. The Russians had not yet used their H-bomb. The threat of annihilation by the retaliation forces had been too great. He had done well in the war, and had been decorated many times for bravery in action. Now he felt the victory that seemed to be in the air, and he had wished it would come quickly, so that he might return to her. Home. The very feel of the word was everything a battle-weary soldier needed to make him fight harder and live longer. Suddenly he had become aware of a droning, whooshing sound above him. It grew louder and louder until he knew what it was. Heavy bombers! The alarm had sounded, and the men had headed for their foxholes. But the planes had passed over, the sun glinting on their bellies, reflecting a blinding light. They were bound for bigger, more important targets. When the all-clear had sounded, the men clambered from their shelters. An icy wind swept the field, bringing with it clouds which covered the sun. A strange fear had gripped him then. Across the Atlantic, over the Pole, via Alaska, the great bombers flew. In cities, great and small, the air raid sirens sounded, high screaming noises which had jarred the people from sleep in time to die. The defending planes roared into the sky to intercept the onrushing bombers. The horrendous battle split the universe. Many bombers fell, victims of fanatical suicide planes or of missiles that streaked across the sky which none could escape. But too many bombers got through, dropping their deadly cargo upon the helpless cities, and not all the prayers or entreaties to any god had stopped their carnage. First there had been the red flashes that melted buildings into molten streams, and then the great triple mushroom cloud filled with the poisonous gases that the wind swept away to other cities, where men had not died quickly and mercifully, 
but had rotted away, leaving shreds of putrid flesh behind to mark the places where they had crawled. The retaliatory forces had roared away to bomb the Russian cities. Few, if any, had returned. Too much blood and life were on their hands. Those who had remained alive had found a resting place on the crown of some distant mountain. Others had preferred the silent, peaceful sea, where flesh stayed not long on bones, and only darting fishes and merciful beams of filtered light found their aluminium coffins. The war had ended. To no avail. Neither side had won. Most of the cities and the majority of the population of both countries had been destroyed. Even their governments had vanished, leaving a silent nothingness. The armies that remained were without leaders, without sources of supplies, save what they could forage and beg from an unfriendly people. They were alone now, a group of tired, battered men, for whom life held nothing. Their families had long since died, their bodies turned to dust, their spirits fled on the winds to a new world. Yet these remnants of an army must return, or at least try. Their exodus was just beginning. Somehow he had managed to hold together the few men left from his force. He had always nourished the hope that she might still be alive. And now that the war was over, he had to return, had to know whether she was still waiting for him. They had started the long trek. Throughout Europe, anarchy reigned. He and his men were alone. All they could do now was fight. Finally, they reached the seaport city of Calais. With what few men he had left, he had commandeered a small yacht, and they had taken to the sea. After months of storms and bad luck, they had been shipwrecked somewhere off the coast of Mexico. He had managed to swim ashore, and had been found by a fisherman's family. Many months he had spent swimming and fishing, recovering his strength, inquiring about the United States. The Mexicans had spoken with fear of the land across the Rio Grande. All its great cities had been destroyed, and those that had been only partially destroyed were devoid of people. The land across the Rio Grande had become a land of shadows. The winds were poisoned, and the few people who might have survived were crazed and maimed by the blasts. Few men had dared cross the Rio Grande into El Mundo Cristi Noviembre, the November world. Those who had, had never returned. In time he had travelled north until he reached the Rio Grande. He had waded into the muddy waters and somehow landed on the American side, in the November world. It was rightly called. The deserts were long. All plant life had died, leaving to those once great fertile stretches nothing but the sad temporal beauty that comes with death. No people had he seen, only the ruins of what had once been their cities. He had walked through them, and all that he had seen were the small mutant rodents, and all that he had heard was the occasional swish of the wind as it whisked along what might have been dead leaves, but wasn't. He had been on the trail for a long time. His food was nearly exhausted. The mountains were just beginning, and he hoped to find food there. He had not found food, but his luck had been with him. He had found a horse. Not a normal horse, but a mutation. It was almost twice as large as a regular horse. Its skin seemed to shimmer and was like glassy steel to the touch. From the centre of its forehead grew a horn, straight out, as the horn of a unicorn. But most startling of all were the animal's eyes, which seemed to speak, a silent mental speech, which he could understand. The horse had looked up as he approached it, and seemed to say, Follow me. And he had followed, 
over a mountain, until they came to a pass, and finally to a narrow path which led to an old cabin. He had found it empty, but there were cans of food and a rifle and many shells. He had remained there for a long time, how long he could not tell, for he could only measure time by the cycles of the sun and the moon. Finally, he had taken the horse, the rifle, and what food was left, and once again started the long journey home. The farther north he went, the more life seemed to have survived. He had seen great herds of horses like his own stampeding across the plains, and strange birds which he could not identify, yet he had seen no human beings. But he knew he was closer now, closer to home. He recognized the land. How, he did not know, for it was much changed. A sensing, perhaps, of what it had once been. He could not be more than two days' ride away. Once he was through this desert, he would find her. He would be with her once again. All would be well, and his long journey would be over. The images faded. Even memory slept in a flow of warm blood. Body and mind slept into the shadows of the dawn. He awoke and stretched the cramped muscles of his body. At the edge of the water he removed his clothes and stared at himself in the rippling mirror. His muscles were lean and hard, evenly placed throughout the length of his frame. A deep ridge ran down the length of his torso, separating the muscles, making the chest broad. Well satisfied with his body, he plunged into the cold water deep down, until he thought his lungs would burst, then swiftly returned to the clean air, tingling in every pore. He dried himself and dressed. Conqueror was eating the long grass near the stream. Quickly he saddled him. No time for breakfast. He would ride all day and the next night, and he would be home. Still northward, the hours crawled slower than a dying man, the sun was a torch that pierced the skin, seeming to melt his bones into a burning stream within his body. But day at last gave way to night, and the sun to the moon. The torch became a white pockmarked goddess with streaming hair called stars. In the moonlight he had not seen the crater until he was at its very edge. Even then he might not have seen it had not the horse stopped suddenly. The wind swirled through its vast emptiness, slapping his face with dusty hands. For a moment he thought he heard voices, mournful, murmuring voices, echoing up from the misty depths. He turned quickly away and did not look back. Night paled into day, day burned into night. There were clouds in the sky now, and a gentle wind caressed the sweat from his tired body. He stopped. There it was. Barely discernible through the moonlight, he saw it. Home. Quickly he dismounted and ran. Now he could see a small light in the window, and he knew they were there. His breath came in hard, ragged gulps. At the window he peered in, and as his eyes became accustomed to the inner gloom, he saw how bare the room was. No matter. Now that he was home, he could build new furniture, and the house would be even better than it had been before. Then he saw her. She was sitting motionless in a straight wooden chair beside the fireplace, the feeble light cast by the embers veiling her in mauve shadows. He waited, wondering if she were. Presently she stirred like a restless child in sleep, then moved from the chair to the pile of wood near the hearth and replenished the fire. The wood caught quickly, sending up long tongues of flame and forming a bright pool of light around her. His blood froze. The creature illuminated by the firelight was a monster, Large, greasy scales covered its face and arms, and there were no hair on his head. 
The gums were toothless cavities in a sunken, mumbling mouth. The eyes, turned momentarily toward the window, were empty of life. No, no, he cried soundlessly. This was not his house. In his delirium he had only imagined he had found it. He had been searching so long. He would go on searching. He was turning wearily away from the window when the movement of the creature beside the fire held his attention. It had taken a ring from one skeleton-like finger and stood, turning the ring slowly as if trying to decipher some inscription inside it. He knew then he had come home. Slowly he moved toward the door. A great weakness was upon him. His feet were stones, reluctant to leave the earth. His body was a weed, shriveled by thirst. He grasped the doorknob and clung to it, looking up at the night sky and trying to draw strength from the wind that passed over him. It was no use. There was no strength, only fear a kind of fear he had never known. He fumbled at his throat, his fingers crawling like cold worms around his neck until he found the locket and the clasp which had held it safely through the endless nightmare days and nights. He slipped the clasp and the locket fell into his waiting hand. As one in a dream, he opened it and stared at the pictures, now in the dim moonlight, no longer faces of those he loved, but grey ghosts from the past. Even the ruby had lost its glow. What had once been living fire was now a dull glob of darkness. Nothing is forever! He thought he had shouted the words, but only a thin sound, the sound of leaves ruffled by the wind, came back to him. He closed the locket and fastened the clasp and hung it on the doorknob. It moved slowly in the wind, back and forth, like a pendulum. Forever, forever, only death is forever. He could have sworn he heard the words. He ran, away from the house, to the large horse with a horn in the centre of its forehead, like a unicorn, once in the saddle. The spurt of strength left him. His shoulders slumped, his head dropped onto his chest. Conqueror trotted away, the sound of his hooves echoing hollowly in the vast emptiness. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Who knows? You might like the next one even better.